my dad raised me pretty much, you know, it, to be like a guy. Like before I could drive a car, he bought, like I got a car, he took it apart and made me put it back together before I could drive it. Cause he didn't want me on the side of the road waiting on some dude to wow. help me. This is Booze Dan Brews, Revolver's action sports podcast. Here's your host, Eric Hendricks. This is Eric Hendricks. A little background on me. I started out as a photographer and then writer for the Ultimate Fighting Championship, having worked on books with Randy Couture, Ken Shamrock, BJ Penn, Joe Rogan, and so many more incredible athletes, eventually working with Forrest Griffin on Got Fight and Be Ready When the Shit Goes Down, two books that went on to become New York Times bestsellers. Then I wrote a book called Bringing Metal to the Children with Humble Viking guitarist from New Jersey and my black label brother, Zach Wilde. Since then, I've been turning out interviews and articles about action sports for Rolling Stone, Playboy, and Revolver, projects that have taken me to incredible places all around the world. Outside of riding, I love skateboarding, playing music, and riding motorcycles. Just living the dream, guys. But I'm so stoked to be able to bring so many incredible athletes and characters to this podcast, and it's such an honor to help share their compelling stories. I really hope you enjoy them, and thank you so much for listening. What's up, guys? Welcome to Revolver Magazine's action sports podcast, Boozed and Bruised. I'm your host, Eric Hendricks, and today I'm here with Letitia Klein, former Playboy playmate turned Harley Davidson hooligan. Letitia's a badass motorcycle racer, model, and lover of life on two wheels. She's had an incredible career in modeling, interviewing for TNA Impact Wrestling, and now a journalist ambassador for women in motoculture. She's ridden motorcycles across country more times than I've been to the grocery store and hails from Glasgow, Kentucky, a true Southern belle with a gypsy soul. All that said, welcome, Letitia, and thank you so much for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me. Good to be here. (laughs) And let's just jump right into something because you just rode across the country from Florida to California on a motorcycle. Yes, I did. To race, actually, which most people wouldn't do because it's quite a haul, 2,700 miles, and it was straight. I mean, we slept a couple of times, uh, very little. And then uh, and then you go race, and that's just beating your body up even more. Most time you want to, like, you know, relax before you go out and do something like that. But uh, I see I'm like a factory rider for Harley-Davidson, but I run myself like a privateer. I just got to do it. Um, so, yeah, we took off from Florida. Uh, me and my boyfriend, Preston, and uh, we rode out. We did an iron butt, which is over 1,024 hours the first day. Took it a little easy the second day. Tell me about an iron butt. What is what is an iron butt? Yeah, that's so basically that's it. It's Well, there's a lot of different iron butts. So you can do 1,024 hours. You can do 1,524 hours, which is a saddle sore gold, I think, or bun burner gold or something. I mean, there's lots of variables. You can do them in 30 hours and, you know, but every year I got one last year. I want to do one every year. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a grand in a day. And what's crazy is we stopped in New Orleans to kind of hang out and party for a few hours during that, which made us riding until five in the morning to still get it. Cause you can get a thousand and sixteen hours. Oh yeah. Yeah. But we rode through some crazy rain and it was, it was challenging. We thought until we got to the desert and that was probably the most challenging that we've ever done. So you did you did basically buns of steel across the country. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a different kind. Yeah. And did uh, and did your boyfriend get a a a, a bun a bun award as well? <laughs> <laughs> he did. He uh, he got it as well. Like we got it together, you know. Oh, and yeah, that, yeah. that was his first one, which is cool. I think once you get one of those, you're like, what else can I do? You know. Oh, start checking them off the list. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, what's the gnarliest one on there? God, I don't know, because there's quite a bit, and it's international. Um, you can look at it. There's like uh, Iron Butt Association online, and like you can see which one you want to do. Um, it's it's not just the gnarliest one. It's also what type of bike you're on, right? Last year I was on a Sportster. It's a much smaller bike. Oh yeah. Um, definitely a lot more painful on my butt um, and doing it. And then this year I was on a Dyna, which was a lot easier for me, faster, just bigger, bigger motorcycle, and uh, I had a better seat, which helped. Good seat is very important on that ride. So riding across the country, and we're like we're we're just getting into summer here. Um, it must have been just hot, hot as hell. It was brutal. So normally most people plan appropriately, and they ride at night through the desert. But we kind of goofed around, and like uh, we were in Texas, and we decided to hang out. We found this bar in the middle of nowhere, and we became friends with the owner. We camped out outside, and in 
in his hammock and woke up to all these deer. It was rad, you know. He had, like, lights and outhouse, so it was, like, perfect. And we did that, and that kind of set us back a little bit. The next day, it was so hot in Texas, so we thought, uh, you know, because, like, 100 degrees is hot, right? Oh, yeah. It just got hotter. But we found a watering hole and swam, and that put us late. So we slept a little, and then the next day we got up, and we had 630 miles left. And it was a little bit of New Mexico, all of Arizona, and then California. And it got up to 120 degrees. It was Jesus. the worst thing I could imagine. I literally have never thought I was going to check out or something. I thought I didn't know if I could make it. You go in a panic. Like, there's nothing in the desert. There's no shade. And you don't know when the next one's coming up. You're, like, full-on panicking. And, you know, it it burned. I got blisters through my gloves and uh, through my pants on my legs. And we were riding with ice bags on our laps and on our handlebars. And Preston was setting, with, setting on ice bags. And uh, we were pouring water every time we stopped. And that would only last, like, six miles. Our clothes would be dry in, like, six miles. And the bags of ice would be melted in 20 when you're when you're riding like let's say i don't know how fast you're going you're going probably eight, like 80 yeah. like let's say you yeah. know because you're flying across trying to get across country yeah it's hotter than hell out there it's 120 it's got to feel like you're like in like some gnarly blow dryer or like yeah yeah that's exactly what it felt like a blow dryer like but really close up to your skin yeah and you didn't want to op- normally open your helmet up to like feel the wind on your face. No, you can't do that. It just would burn. It's it, burning you. Yeah, they grounded flights actually because it was so hot. They were afraid the planes would crash and take off, so they weren't even flying out. And when we would stop, we were an oddity because people were like, "Oh my god, I can't believe you guys are doing this." They're handing us like Gatorades and water from their car. We only saw one other motorcyclist on that trip. Um, he was probably just one, as dumb one as other, us. One. <laughs> <laughs> one other stupid person out there. I wasn't going to say stupid, but <laughs> off camber. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we did it, you know, and I can't believe we did. I mean, I just, I think that that's, I almost want to do like some gnarly, amazing race show now that we did it. I'm like, fuck yeah. I'm sorry. Can I curse on this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. You can curse all you want. Yeah. Raised by a trucker, so it comes out a yeah. little bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Raised by a trucker. Yeah, my dad was a trucker. <laughs> he was and um and your dad rode and worked on bikes yeah he built them in the living room of our house and um i grew up around motorcycles and my baby pictures are on bikes that setting on bikes he would build i have a video where i'm like i'm setting up i don't know how to walk yet and i'm helping him i'm handing him tools and i don't even know what i'm handing him obviously but he's rebuilding a car and like he's just doing stuff and i'm just sitting there right beside him you know and yeah so he put me on a bike the minute i before I learned to ride a bicycle, actually, um, it was a 50, some like janky homemade training wheels. And because he just made what I, we have the saying in the South, it's like make and do with what you got. And so it's like whatever you got I mean, in your yard, you can usually make something out of it. So he just did that. And I've been riding ever since. <laughs> yeah. So in the South, you grew up in Kentucky, right? Yeah. 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 Born, born and you, and you grew up in sort of like a pretty unusual place. Can, to most people i think yeah um tell me a little bit about that so it's mammoth cave kentucky largest or longest cave in the world um i always say longest cave in the world smallest town in america population 750 people and it never changes because when one woman gets pregnant another man leaves town Uh. (laughs) (laughs) but uh the uh it's it's 485 discovered miles long the second largest cave is uh, 163 in germany so it's huge and my family are spelunkers which is why we live there so i grew up just with caves in my backyard literally everywhere and that's what that's kind of where that sense of adventure came from it's oh yeah just going underground for 300 feet which is silly if you think about what child does that (laughs) but but who else can say they come from a long line of spelunkers i know right yeah. I don't think anyone, unless I, like you're just your relatives, that's it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, my uh, great great uncle discovered a few Germans. <laughs> a few Germans. <laughs> <laughs> my great great uncle discovered part of the cave, which made it the longest cave, and then it was trapped in 1925 for 17 days and died. It's actually a really cool story. There was a lot of movies, documentaries, and books written about it. Um, it helped make it the national park, and uh, like Lindbergh flew the news about it. It was the second largest story between the world wars. It changed journalism. The journalist that covered it got a Pulitzer Prize. It's a really big deal. And holy shit! Yeah, so I had big shoes to fill, you know. But I ended up not cave exploring. I was a cave guide for a while, but uh-huh. I had to get out of them caves and see the rest of the world, you know. <laughs> yeah, there's something beyond spelunking for you. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, and then at at a pretty pretty young age, you got into modeling. Yes. 
I that started at a funeral. Strangely enough, uh, I was. Do you tell. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really into necrophilia modeling. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> uh, no, I was, I don't know whose fun- funeral it was. And um, my uncle actually said there, he's like, Tish, have you ever thought about modeling? And I was like, no. And it was a really weird time to bring it up. But then from then on out, it got this, it planted in my head. I mean, I'm from this tiny town. I didn't even know where you, where you go to do any of that. And uh, just so Hopefully happened. not your uncle's house. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was fucked up. No, it's funny. It's not, we're talking about <laughs> we Kentucky. We are talking about Kentucky. <laughs> <laughs> no offense, uh, Kentucky. <laughs> so I started school, and we had this. We had to like create these boards about our life, and this chick. There was this board up, and it was like all these things like that describes you, and it was this runway. And I was like, girl on runway, and I was like, who's that? And the girl was like, oh, that's me. And I was like, you model, and I said, where? And Nashville, Tennessee, is the next biggest town. It's like an hour and a half from our house, and. She gave me this number to this agent, and I sat there on the floor, and I like was building up the courage to call. And I finally called, and it was like a weird. It was like not a right number. I kept calling. And, well, I'm dyslexic, so I fucking was dialing the wrong number, and I figured it out. <laughs> and I called, and I went and met with them, and I'm in the waiting room, and all these girls had like these books, and I have nothing, but they ha- they like wanted me on the spot. I signed really early to this place in Tokyo. I went over there and lived and. Uh, did a lot of modeling before everything was digital, you know? And, you lived uh, in Japan for a while. Yeah. Yeah. Doing modeling at what? How old were you? 14. At 14. Yeah. So you get a handler and you ship your stuff back and you go to, like, that goes, you know, for your schooling and you you come back and forth and, uh, you, get, you know, they give you, yeah, I mean, it's like a whole deal over there and you go out on these castings and uh, I lived with three other models in an apartment. Uh, they were all from everywhere. No one really spoke each other's languages, which was crazy. So it's cool. It was a cool experience. I mean, coming from KC, Kentucky to uh, Tokyo is like gnarly. Like, oh yeah, it's like there's another like, planet. Yeah, 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 I didn't, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> At that young of age, but I'm like glad for it because I don't think if I had done anything like that, I don't know if I'd gotten out of the small town. Not that being in a small town's bad, but I just I was glad to have that. Oh, you were straight out of the pond. Yeah. 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 I mean, in, into Tokyo. So yeah. at 14. So your whole world changed forever. Right. I don't even think I knew anything about Tokyo before that. Like I I was well read, but not about Tokyo. I don't know. I just. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I did that and modeled for a while and then always rode uh, motorcycles and kind of did both. And But it was hard for me, especially then, like people wouldn't take me legitimate as a motorcyclist. And then modeling, my agents hated it. Like, if I skateboarded or modeled, and they would make me sign contracts that I wouldn't do either. And I would. And then I'd show up to a place all busted up from crashing or something, and I'd get in trouble <laughs> and get fined. And then, um, so yeah, it was just a weird balance. And then I did it forever. And uh, one day I was like, I'm just going to stop modeling or I'm going to do what I want. You know, and I just started riding motorcycles full time. Sounds like a pretty good choice. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was the right choice. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I just was like, you know. But your modeling career was like pretty significant. I mean, you, you've you been on dozens of magazine covers. You've been in probably like 100 magazines. Yeah. Uh, you were Playboy Playmate. You were Maxim. Like, I mean, there's, there's Sports Illustrated. There's a huge list. Oh, yeah. yeah. Was like, I forgot about Sports Illustrated. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, no, it's okay. Yeah. I actually was really stoked on that one. I can't believe I forgot. Yeah. Like, that was really cool because I just love what they do, you know. And, mm-hmm. uh yeah, I did all that. You know, that was later when I, because when I was young, I just was like a stick figure. I was like one of those weird, you know, fashion type models. And that the reason why I went to Tokyo is because five seven, I'm shorter. Five seven is really tall over there, and blonde hair, blue eyes. I love that. And uh, when I came back over here and I moved to Florida, uh, it was that's all swimsuit lingerie. So I booked that stuff like nonstop, and that's where uh, Playboy. I was on TNA wrestling on Spike TV. I was a backstage interviewer for that. It was the host for motocross and supercross and GNCC racing, MotoGP and superbike. And I was literally just, just everywhere trying to do everything. All that was happening all at once. Yeah. yeah I was on the road yeah. like 250 days a year. Uh-huh. And you skateboarded from event to event. Yeah, basically. <laughs> basically. Sometimes I was, I had two events in one day if they were close enough, like some superbike and super, supercross or motocross races were close together. You were, um, so you were a backstage interviewer for TNA impact. Yeah. Um, what do you have like any like favorite story, like from that time you're hanging around all these like 
big sweaty wrestlers? Uh, I have a lot. I so I used to love wrestling when I was little. J- Junkyard Dog and Jake the Snake were like me and my sister's favorite, and we would reenact it and wrestle. Like which, which one were you? I was uh, Jake the Snake. Good choice. And, <laughs> I know. I got to meet him too, which was really cool. Oh, that's incredible. Yeah, but um. We so I like grew up with that, and then I didn't really get into it uh, anymore. And when I got hit up from the producer from TNA, I was really close, and they were like, uh, asked if we wanted to come down. Thanks, and they so they asked if we if I wanted to come down, check it out. I went, and I was like, oh, this is for real. I loved it. You know, it was a whole production. It was Universal Studios. I just did, you know, it was amazing. And yeah. uh, I loved how nice the wrestlers were. And there's this, like, underground code that they have. Like, every time you go on set, you have to shake everyone's hand or give them a hug. It's super disrespectful if not. Like, there's this, uh, it's just, I don't know. It's, it's like a bro code. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. And uh, and then I started learning more about it. But so the first day, they're like, you're hired. Like, they interviewed me. Then they're you're like, you're hired. We want you. And so they didn't tell me because they wanted my reaction. I got pushed my first day on set, I'm doing an interview, and, like, they got all mad because the wrestlers were fighting. They, like, picked me up and threw me to through a door. And I got all cut off on my arm. And, like, it was like they wanted that for the show. And whatever. It was rad. And um, Heads up would have been nice. I know. It would yeah. have been yeah. so I could have prepared <laughs> out of fall. They were going to throw you through a door. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, after that, I started doing wrestling training. So I learned how to run ropes and take hits because they would black hole slam me or, like, I would just, like, straight wrestle, which is cool because when I drink, I like to wrestle anyway, so it was, like, normal life, just sober. No, you sober just got wrestling. some – happen to have some <laughs> professional experience. Yeah. 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 And uh, we just started all hanging out. You know, if you've ever seen the movie The Wrestler, it actually is really true to that lifestyle. You do the shows. You do pay-per-view. You film all the other ones, and then you do these live shows everywhere, and then do indie shows. So I'd be hired to do independent shows where fans would come, and they would meet you, and, like, you'd sign autographs, and then you'd put on a wrestling show for them. And these guys, like, work hard, travel hard, and every third hit actually makes contact. So there's always someone going to the medic every single show. Or, you know, you cut yourself with razor blades to make yourself bleed more. The tacks that they throw down, oh, and yeah. you land, those are real. That yeah. goes into your skin. We always pick them out with pliers on the back set, backstage. And oh, Yeah, was that one of your duties? No. <laughs> <laughs> backstage. You know what's crazy is that every, you have to have a license every state you go into. So I'd have to do stress tests and drug tests and, like, you have to be fully blood tested before you could go into a state to wrestle because we bleed on each other. So you have to oh. make sure you know everybody's clean, which is cool. So um, that's something that probably a lot of people don't think about. Yeah. yeah. And like some like the the league that you were uh, associated with was like pretty renowned for like the blood and gut stuff. You know, like yeah. straight up like backyard wrestling, like barbed wire. Yeah. Yeah. Tax. Like we had St- we had all the you know Sting Huck Hogan was there for a while, like Abyss. Uh, just Kurt Angle, which is actually an Olympic gold medalist wrestler, and then went to wrestling. Right. And, uh, you know, we had, yeah, we had a ton of people, like, you know, we from WWE to whatnot, you know. So it's it was a big, it was a big show. It still is a big show. Dude, so this is crazy. So you went from being a model in Tokyo at 14 to, and motorcycle riding, to being, working with TNA as a, a backstage interviewer with wrestlers. Mm-hmm. And... You also worked with President Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. So. Uh, yeah, I, uh, well, in between that time, before that happened, I was on a reality show, Beauty and the Geek. And you were on a show. Of course you were. Yeah. 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 I was and the geek. You so. were the, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was the geek and the beauty because my geek got hurt the second episode and I had to do both challenges so. okay so you were stunt geek or stunt beauty i or, was both uh, i was you, yeah it depend on what episode <laughs> it was it was you know but yeah i did that and then uh made it all the way through which was really cool it was a great experience definitely test your patience you got cameras on you 22 hours a day and uh for six solid weeks and you're sequestered so you can't like contact the outside world you can't even watch tv because we can't date the show mm-hmm. we can't talk about what's happening and uh yeah, so that was that was, and you're with, you know, other people in a house nonstop, and you don't always get along with those other people. Oh right, I, pro- I mean that's part of the plan. Yeah, it yeah. is for sure. And uh, but it was cool. I mean, I didn't like get into any drama fights. I'm not about drama. You know, I just do my thing and just try to have fun. So right, it was a uh, it was a good time. And then yeah, I I went back and uh, my dad actually ended up passing away 
a month after that show aired. And then, um, I moved home for a little bit for eight months. And then I was like, you know what? I had this like moment of like, what am I doing? Why am I doing all this crazy stuff? Like I need to grow up. I was like in my late twenties and, uh, I just moved to New York and didn't know anyone. And uh, yeah, I started bartending at a really nice restaurant and got hired from different jobs to bartend other events and got hired to do events, uh, planning for a hedge fund company. And I went to Trump for a sponsorship and ended up getting hired there. <laughs> That's how that worked. That's how that worked. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. And then next thing you know, you're working in an office with, uh, with the old Donald or now yeah. Yeah, uh, current president. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know he was going to be president then. Um, but yeah, it was cool. I mean, he's, at, I don't know how to, I don't want to get too into politics because it's not my thing. Oh um, yeah. That's not our thing. Either. Yeah. It's cool. an action sports show. So if you, did you guys ever wrestle? I, I wanted to wrestle him just because mm-hmm. I think I could take him. I mean, yeah. I still think I could take him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but uh, no wrestling. I'm sure he wrestled a few others in the office, though. I mean, the question, <laughs> you know, the question is naked did, wrestling. Did he ever try to grab? Did he? <laughs> no, he's actually. You know the saying. I know. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, he uh, no yeah no naked wrestling in the office. Yeah, yeah. He had a role. It was. Yeah, no. Right, right. So what what did you do? You were you were a marketing director. You had like a big time job for for Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was it. So he has his own production company, and he also has a modeling agency as well. And uh, then he does from the desk of Trump, which is a YouTube channel, which I did did for him. And then um, he has a suit line, which is where I parlayed my job from. So the suit company that makes the suits makes suits for Mark Echo. I went to Mark Echo, and I was a marketing director, of PR, and marketing there, and creative direction too. I did two jobs at one time and right. for 16 hours a day, nonstop worked really hard. It's New York city. So that's what you do, right? You got to hustle. Do. Yeah. Hustle, hustle, hustle. Yeah. yeah. And I imagine working for someone like Trump, you're, it's probably, uh, yeah. I mean, 20 hours a day work. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, it was, you know, it was fun. It was corporate, but not too corporate, which was the good part about it, you know, and, um, and PR marketing on that side was, I had a team of people underneath me. When I went to Echo, I didn't really, so I had to do, but that was actually the most fun because we got to do like grassroots, guerrilla type marketing, you know, shut down Times Square so we could like do this big, we had hired all these graffiti artists to come and spray paint to like do this against this anti-graffiti law. Um, We, he was wanting to stop corporal punishment. So one time I built these two paddling machines. I had to contact the sex toy company and had them build these two machines for me for South by Southwest and I had to get a book of world records out there so that we could paddle more people that had ever been paddled in a day there. And they paddled themselves. Like you could do the, how much and how hard it was, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. And so we had people lining up out so the door. So can you still get these things? <laughs> I bet that company makes them to sell them. Cause it was a powers. great idea. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just bend over this bench and you hit this button and this paddle comes out and just smacks you, you know? And some people liked it. Some people came twice in that line. Yeah. Tempting. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> But that's the type of marketing I did, which was really fun. I got to, we had a cool office. I got to ride my dirt bike around the office in my pajamas. And, you rode your dirt bike in the office. Yeah, cause, and we had a basketball court. And Mark collected uh, all the Star Wars stuff from the movie, so we had like just gnarly stuff from. Like, why? Just, why did you ever leave that job? Like you said, Star Wars dirt biking. I know. <laughs> paddling. Uh, is, that sounds like uh, I know, yeah, yeah, I know. Well, I job. I left it to go fly water jetpacks, so that was cool too, right? That's sure. That's I redeemed myself, right? Water, so you went straight to astronaut. Yeah, yeah of course you did. Yes, yeah. they owned a company, uh, Jetlev, and that was water jetpacks. So I would go. I went down to F- Florida, Fort Lauderdale. And I would travel all over the world to teach these rich fucks on a boat how to fly a jetpack. And then I would... Uh, Is that hard to do? Because I've seen them do it. And it looks like... I feel like I would just like run myself right like yeah. face, face into the water. <laughs> you will at first. Yeah. No, I, it's remote control at first. We get you used to it. And then we talk you through it through a headset. And then we let you off the remote. And you... It's a... It's like a motorcycle, but it's not spring-loaded, the okay. throttle. So it's like just a little bit. Mm-hmm. And it's... Uh, it's not uh, PSI. It's like literally, get, you know, a thousand gallons per second. It's like oh, yeah. a lot of water. That's what keeps you up. Mm-hmm. And you go 30 feet in the air, 30 feet below the water, and 30 miles an hour for four solid hours. So were you on that throttle. thing all the time, like stunting and stuff like that? Yeah, I would do. I got to where I could do stuff. I'd take off from the land and land on the land because I hate the water. So I just, it scares me. So I would just do that. Or I'd land on the back of the boat that tethers along. 
So and we found one thing that you're afraid of. Water yeah. <laughs> in the dark okay. and spiders. All right. Well, we got we got a, now we got a list. <laughs> Noted. And, and creepy old men. Yeah. Oh yeah. Okay. I think everyone's afraid of creepy old men. And yeah, but no, that's it. I'll still do it though. That's the thing. If I uh, am afraid of something, I want to do it more. So I swam with sharks and for National Geographic because it was like when, it's my favorite magazine mm-hmm. beside you guys. And then <laughs> and then. Uh, um, I, when am I ever going to do that? And then I skydive and fly planes. And so I'll do that. I'm scared the whole time, but I'm scared when I race, you know, I still do it. Yeah. Yeah. You only got one life. You only got one life. Let's talk about racing. You're, um, so you've, you, you're the only right now, uh, and the first ever Harley Davidson hooligan racer. Yeah. So officially on the team. Yeah. 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 So Harley came to me and asked if I wanted to join the Harley hooligan team. And then I could build a team from that, and it's all dudes. And uh, they, I was like, yeah, that sounds awesome. So got together a bike, got another bike, and uh, started adding girls. Last night was my first time having another female racer with me, and she won. So I'm stoked about that. Sarah Price, she's amazing. You picked the right girl. I Sarah. did. Thank you, Sarah Price. <laughs> no, yeah. she's so humble, too. That's what's even better about her. She's like this badass chick that is just, she just is just rocks in all ways around. But um and then, yeah, so that's, you know, I started doing that. I didn't really... So you're a hooligan. What Hooligan racer. Tell me what hooligan racing is. Uh, it's basically 750cc and up motorcycles once, you know, it's a bike, it's like a street bike that can go on the road, but you can put on the track. You have to alter them in some way to be able to ride on it. But uh, no front brake, no headlight, and just having a good time. You know, that's kind of what it is. Hooligan racing to me is like what you would do with your buddies in your backyard. And that's kind of what it feels like when we go out there. It's just having fun and getting people excited about motorcycling and, and flat tracking. And uh, again, you know, because it's like probably the coolest type of ra- racing, motorcycle yeah. racing that I could I can think of out there. I totally agree with you. Um, now I've been to uh, a couple of two, – two of those flat track races with you. Mm-hmm. And um, – just watching everybody from like mini bikes to dudes riding choppers on the dirt yeah, to, uh, to, to like legitimate, like flat track bikes, you know? Um, and in, yeah, in some cases it's really like Mad Max, like just bring, what do they say? Like ra- race what you brought or whatever. Run or, what you brought. Run, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. 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 You know, the, the Southern sayings, it's so much better. Yeah. <laughs> run, run what you brought. Did I say it country? Run what, <laughs> it's run what you brought. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. So that's, that means whatever you got, like literally you have a lawnmower out there if you wanted to ride that mm-hmm. and you could put whatever costume more, you know, the crazier, the better. The crowd goes nuts over that or the boonie bikes, the little bikes. And that's just fun. Cause you see these things when you're in the crowd and you see that, you're like, I can do that. And then the next race you're out there doing it, you know? Right. Right. That's yeah. What it's want. very accessible. Yeah. Yeah. If it, it seems very accessible. I mean, there was definitely some rippers last night that, that were out there to win that are pros. Right. But there was a lot of dudes who uh, it was their first or second time, and they're racing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not a pro at it. I've only been doing it for a couple of years. I never flat-tracked before, and the first time I did it, it crashed, and I'm still hurt from it. But I love it. That's what – it's just addicting, you know? And even those pros that were out there were still laughing to have a good time. They wanted to win, but I guarantee that they didn't care if they did it, you know? Like – really this is all every i've the feed today on everyone's instagram is like most fun i've had on a motorcycle in years and these are pro guys that have pro cards and have done some gnarly stuff you know oh yeah i saw a post from like twitch yeah yeah it was like a pro metal militia dude back, yeah. backflips yeah super cross kind of guy and and yeah and and he said it was the most fun he's had in years yeah 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 and he's out there just sending on a flat track with the boys yeah and what he was talking about i was talking to him in the pits and he was saying like how different you know, people think just because they're pro, like they're going to be really good at this, <clears throat> but it's, if they have never ridden flat track, it's totally different. It's like de-learning everything that you've learned is in moto, motocross and like, you know, your leg position is different and you wear a hot shoe so you can put your leg down. They don't do that in moto and they use front brake more. We don't have front brakes. You know, you, you've got to trust that out of control feeling, you know, you want to slide out, get on top of the bike, you know? And yeah, so it's a, uh, it's different. So they start out as a handicap that is kind of, it's an equalizer. So you can have pros out there, but you know, they're not hooligans, you know, Yeah, but they're not hooligans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah, you, you mentioned crashing. Um, I, yeah, we were in 
Salem. Yeah, we were in yeah. Salem. Yeah, and I watched you. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. You I think, came I to the hospital with me. I came to the hospital with you. Yeah, yeah. Out. <laughs> yeah. You were out cold. Yeah. Um, yeah, you went yeah, high sighted, I think, and, and the, your throttle got stuck wide open. You hit the wall. Yeah. I watched you ragdoll just flip over the bike and unconscious on the track. Is that what it did? I yeah. don't know. <laughs> I have no clue. I was out. Yeah, yeah. You know, it was a scary, like one of the scariest things I've ever seen. And because you just because you went into um, convulsions too, so I, I did? was like, oh, "Oh fuck, she's dead!" You know, like it was so scary. Everyone was running across the tracks and stuff, and then ambulance mm-hmm. on the track, and they got you on, you know, on the stretcher and stuff. I was like, "Oh, good, she's not dead," you know. Yeah. But it's so scary, and then. Yeah, I didn't know I did all that. Um, yeah, I just remember waking up and the guy asking me how old I was, and I couldn't remember. And I said, "I think I'm definitely having memory loss." I should have said, you never ask a lady how old she is, damn it. Like, cause I wanted to stay at the track. I felt fine. Yeah. I just couldn't remember things, but oh, yeah. I just wanted to stay there. And, uh, so yeah, I did, I crashed. And then three days later, I was, or four days later, I was back on a bike in Milwaukee. But you weren't, Friday. you weren't just back on a bike. You rode like a thousand miles or something. That one I drove. You drove I there. drove okay. thousand miles and I had a party <laughs> on day three when you're, I'm like so much stimulation for a uh, concussion brain. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I had a party and then went to flat out Friday and rode bikes for four hours with the guys and then commentated on the races. Okay. Yeah. So, but yeah, I guess that's what you do and it's pretty, you're not supposed to do that, but whatever i mean when when do we ever listen yeah you know? i mean it didn't stifle you you know you went straight from getting a cat scan to the next race yeah yeah i stayed up late i say you're supposed to stay up i guess after a concussion so i stayed up and made sure that oh, i didn't yeah. die in my sleep yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah you stayed you stay awake <laughs> yeah so being the only um female hooligan like mm-hmm. what is that like do you do you feel like you are encountered like like obstacles um I can't encounter obstacles because I'm the only one on the East Coast, so that makes it a little more difficult. And, you know, Motorcycle Mecca is West Coast, California. Everyone has everything at their disposal from parts to, um, you know, fabrication shops and things that you would need, uh, mechanics. And so that's that's challenging. And then, yeah, as a female, a little bit more. I mean, I'm I'm thin, and these are heavy bikes, you know, and uh, that's that's a little more challenging. I don't get any, you know – misogynistic discrimination no one's ever said this is a man's sport or anything it's everyone's fa- actually been super welcoming it's all family for you yeah it's yeah. all everyone's been really helpful i think that if i was out there and i was all about this trying to self-promote and you know use my that my background as a model to do it then i wouldn't get respect but i legitimately work really hard to earn the respect from the guys that go out there you know i know my place and i know i'm not at the top I just try to ride hard, keep a line, respect everyone that's out there, and then they'll just give it right back to me. And you know your shit, like, <laughs> like from you know working out, handing dad the tools at yeah. you know just a few years old, yeah, to getting um, brand new Harley Davidsons. Like you chop the shit out of those things and tear them apart the second you get them. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I gotta make them ri- ride ready. Like they, you know, I no stock bike is is good riding on you know you got to make it the way i ride you know i ride for long distances and and i ride really hard and um yeah you got to i mean you got to get your hands dirty and go in right. for but it you, you do all that stuff yourself like i do most of it so on my 750 i did a, a lot of it cut it up and did what i could but i was traveling at that time so i didn't have a lot of and it had to be done at a certain time so i didn't completely finish it uh you know, I wish I could say that I did, but just that sometimes that's the way it works out is, you know, and, and two, I, I wouldn't be as educated on that building a flat track bike from that 750. It's a little bit more complex because it's a very electric bike and not a lot of people make parts for it to convert it. It's a big conversion. It's not easy. Mm-hmm. And, uh, the Sportster is a little bit easier for sure. Yeah. So mechanic, astronaut, uh, world yeah, pre- taker over yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'm basically the best person out there i'm just kidding no. oh no I, I yeah no you're more humble than that no. um but but you and so and you're also a journalist like you contribute like articles like all over the place like i'll see you in like all of like the bonnie or all the you know the big cycle magazines and yeah rolling sands magazines everyone's magazines you're telling your stories and helping other people tell theirs yeah like how did you get into all that I think words, that's what I want to be known for more than anything else. I, when I was, uh, 
I was a little shit in school and I was mean to this chick we had in English. This is where writing came from in English class in like seventh grade. I took this girl's journal and I wrote some nasty shit in it. I hated her. And, <laughs> and I, the teacher caught me and she said she's flunking me the entire, no matter what I did, I was going to F. And we had to write this paper and I wrote it. I really put my heart into it because it was about something very personal and I got a 99 and it taught me two things. If I work really hard at something, I can always get what I want. And that maybe I have something really good to say. And uh, so it changed my life. And so I had always written. I never put anything out there, just really shy. And then um, I did this thing in Canada. I rode, flew planes and hover, like, uh, f- hover boats and motocross and um, four-wheelers. And this magazine asked me to write a story about it. And so I did. And I loved it. And I was like, well, let me see if I can write for other ones. So I wrote a list of all the magazines I wanted to be in. And I thought, oh, I'll give myself a year to be in them. And in six months, I'd have been in all of them. And I was like, sick. So I started writing. I did that. You know, I did one round for free. And now I actually get paid for articles, which is really cool to be able to do that. And nice because you're you're at all these events, you're yeah. participating in all these events, and so you have this like sort of first person narrative that you can share what it was actually like to experience it, like yeah. maybe what it was like on the track, like getting, you know getting dirt hucked in your face and flying around, turning left all the time, or yeah, or, or what, whatever it was. Yeah. yeah, I try to bring a different perspective to it because you know it's a it's a very similar topic that you're always writing about, and so I just want to try and do a different twist. You know, something that you can't already Google and look. Of yeah. the race results. I, no, and I can think of an example right off the top of my head. Um, you wrote something in Roland Sands' new magazine mm-hmm. um, about a jacket. Oh, yeah. So, But it was about your jacket that mm-hmm. had that you'd worn for like thousands and thousands of miles of riding. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that was such a great story and a cool <laughs> perspective because it's like it was sort of the story of the jacket, you know, yeah. and, and its life, you know, and it per- personified the jacket for me. And I was like... God, that's such a rad idea. Yeah, I wish. Yeah, thank I mean, you. I, w- I wish Eric had thought of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can write about your boots. Yeah, I'm there gonna write. Go. It. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Shh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Coming soon <laughs> next week. Eric's boots. <laughs> but I love that stuff because it tells a story. It's a good way to talk about a trip. But like that trip and all your trips are basically your wear and tear on your jacket, and it's like you know, like you you can tell it. You, there's no denying it when you look at some of my gear that I don't write in fact i've got a lot of new jackets i just never wear them because i feel like people are gonna like oh she's just a new writer you know and i'm not (laughs) selfie seekers right yeah Yeah, because it because it is there's a lot of girls getting into moto um the last like couple years maybe they're not getting into moto they just want to be around like yeah sort of a more trendy or popular scene or look Mm -hmm. cool so they get a motorcycle jacket and they go to born free once a year yeah yeah i know and i don't you know, it's like catch 22. I mean, it's annoying in a way and it sets some of us back, but at the same time, as long as we keep, keep it trendy, we're going to get, maybe we turn that person who wants to be in the trend into a long-term motorcyclist and they find where they were supposed to be after all, which is really cool too, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I just, I think I just, me, I think it's more for me instead of anyone else. Like I just work really, really, really hard to get respect. When I go to the rallies and I get hired to go to a lot of the rallies, to either cover it or to do rides and lead lead rides, I ride to them. Because at the motorcycle rallies, those are long-term motorcyclists. These are people who have done hundreds and hundreds of thousands of miles on their bikes. And if I fly there or haul there, I don't get their respect. They're, I'm going to be some trendy chick trying to like jump on this trend. And so I ride and... and uh, you know, that's just, that's what I want at the end of the day. You right. know, it's, it's not Coachella. It's Sturgis. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, although you rode... You rode a motorcycle to Coachella, so. I did. Yeah. <laughs> I hated it. I know it sounds <laughs> You bad. hated it. I hate whatever that whole of it. I mean, and no, music is real. It's really cool, but it's like not my, I mean, I'm gross. Like I ride a bike and then I'm like dirty and like, you know, I don't, I wear all black and leather and uh, that's like fringy and flowy and for the chicks out there. I don't know. I just didn't feel like i fit in oh it's a different vibe yeah it's a totally different vibe yeah, yeah i love music music's trend you know goes through everything but it's just i just i don't know N- not really my scene i like dirty grungy bar shows if i'm well, gonna see music i want to see it in a bar the good news is ozzy's playing at sturges this I year know. So. i know yeah, <laughs> yeah so you'll get all the dirty grungy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's my jam um and speaking of being at sturges you have to go there early um, because you're putting on a festival. Yes. Yeah, so, um, the wild gypsy tour, which is a, um, 
first ever women's only motorcycle camping event. Um, that you founded. Of course, you founded a festival. <laughs> yeah, because I have nothing else to do at the time. <laughs> Why would you do that? I have that? a lot. I have a great team. Uh, you know, the the owner of the chip came to me and asked me if I wanted to put on put it on. And I was like, yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, the venue is really cool. 140 years ago, there wasn't a single woman on the census there. So it's like, rad, we're going to bring all these women. I mean, really, if you think about it, back in the day, like, you know, 30 30 years ago, there wasn't a lot of women that rode motorcycles to that rally. Like a couple that would, Michael Lichter, the photographer, like sh- shot them for Easy Rider because he's like, they were an oddity. Like they were just, it was really rare to see. And so um, I was There's like, like, yeah. like Folsom State Prison out there. Right. Oh, yeah. It's a dangerous territory for us women. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, the, so yeah, there, so I was like, let's bring all these women there. And the grand marshal for Sturges actually is a woman first time ever in 77 years. Uh, so it's like the year of women, you know, and, and then, yeah, so we camp and have this whole section. We get to do, you know, shoot guns, lead rides, have classes, concerts, uh, and just camp and have a good time at, it that sounds awesome. Yeah, I want to go to the women's festival and yeah. shoot guns. Well, get a wig and a bra. I mean, <laughs> sneak on in. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. And so, yeah. So, and this is going to be like an annual thing. Yep. If we got a five-year deal. So it's five years that we get that spot for sure. We'd like to take it on the road. It's called the Wild Gypsy Tour. Uh, you can take, we'd love to take it in other areas. Sturges just being the one. You know, Sturges, we want to give a revival. It's one of the oldest rallies out there. If we don't like breathe the new like some life into it it's going to eventually die i mean even though there's 500 to 700,000 people that come every year it's an older type of crowd and uh but there because a lot of the younger generation don't realize black hills is some of the best riding out there um sturges is just a crazy time the buffalo chip is the largest motorcycle concert venue in the world you know there's these really cool things and uh you just got to make them see that they just think of it oh my dad or my grandfather went to that event you know no. yeah they need the new kids the yeah. new generation yeah i think once you go you love it and then you start coming back every year it's a tradition just like it will be or it was for all those guys right right and that's the big trick with i think motorcycling in general is yeah. getting the younger generation into it and, you know, all these moto companies, like, creating new bikes that are cool cool for a younger generation instead of having, like, these old baggers, you know, and stuff. And yeah. The, the geezer gliders. Yeah. They start getting, like, the cooler, like, cafe racers, the dinos, yeah. all those different types of bikes that get, you know, that I think that's the, the big trick, right? Right. Yeah. You want to – yeah, for sure. I mean, because if you think about it from, like, a marketing standpoint or, like, a brand, a younger demographic could have 10 to 12 more bikes left in them to buy. And an older demographic may have one, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. we may not buy that $40,000 motorcycle because we can't afford it, but eventually I'm going to, I'm mm-hmm. going to have to, I do too many cross country trips. I'm killing myself. Like I need time, a bagger. It's going to be a hundred thousand dollar bike. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> right. I know. <laughs> I better get a sponsor quick. Mm-hmm. Call Donald. <laughs> he's, he's a little mo- busy. He's moved up. He's I know. Moved up. <laughs> I don't have a number to the white house. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, we, I, you were so techie though. I figured you could hack into that. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. I was teaching you guys how to use your iPhone earlier i just yeah i don't know how that is i've got a son so he keeps me cool and teaches me all those things about technology yeah how old is your son 15 he's been riding since he was four i put him on a dirt bike when he was four too yeah of course you did tradition yeah so he's got to be the coolest kid in the world then i think he's pretty rad or like like equally as cool as the coolest i got a son too so yeah yeah. so yeah there you go yeah Yeah, they grew you know he grew up in a cool lifestyle going to the motocross and supercross with me every weekend yeah uh, you know, rode with some of the top people out there. He, I take him to these events and he ends up knowing most of the people and just going and doing his own thing, which is rad. And, um, yeah, he, uh, you know, he just, you know, dirt biking and skateboarding. He skateboarded since he was three. He had, um, this guy, Chris Blake, who's a skateboarder. Uh, he's based out of Florida, but he's all over, um, t- t- trained him, taught him how to skate. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, he just kind of does that life of adventure and he's set. Yeah, he He's is. Set. He used to ride his dirt bike. I'd let him ride it to preschool. D- does he like your boyfriend? Yeah, he loves them. Oh my god, like are a fifteen-year-old dude. <laughs> I'd be like, stay away from my mom. Dude, yeah. they actually love each other. You know, it's cr- they text <laughs> each other and they. So the first day, I got Caleb another little fifty to put in the back. This is a pit bike, just to fuck around on. Yeah. And uh, Preston immediately built a track in our yard, and so then they're out there doing that, and they're. Oh, you built. 
Preston built him a track. Yeah, built him a track. Uh, okay, yeah. yeah. So he's in. Yeah, yeah he's yeah. in automatically. Yeah. That's a win. Yeah. Now my son is like, you better not ever dump him or I'm not talking to you again. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's flipped. The tables have turned. I know. He likes him so much better. Literally, the other day I was so mad because I had texted Preston about something and my son was texting him and Preston was only answering my son. I'm like, what the heck? Because they were talking about bikes. So, and like building a new bike or Preston whatever. Preston was so busted. I know. Yeah. Whatever. I yeah. Was, Whatever, I'll do my own thing. <laughs> uh, maybe Preston doesn't know that you also ride in a motorcycle gang. Oh yeah, I do. That's uh-huh. right. We're pretty badass. Uh, yeah, us gangs, <laughs> yeah. us chicks, uh, Iron Lilies. The Iron Lilies. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. What are, what what is your gang about? Uh, we so it's a couple years now. We've been doing it. Uh, we started as a joke because we just thought it was a joke. Like, not that all these girl groups are jokes, but you know, we just did it to have fun, not to get popular or anything, and. We just happened to all be a bunch of chicks that lived in the same area and had sportsters. And we just rode together. And then one day we started getting hit up by all these people because we ride a lot. We'd meet four days a week at minimum. And we had mandatory meetings on Sunday. And we would ride that day, do a couple hundred miles. And uh, and we just so we just started a group. And we then we put all these rules to it. We didn't open it up to anyone because we just wanted quality over quantity. Like invite only? Well, no invite. No we invite. Just no invite. The gang is the gang. The gang is the gang. But okay. then we opened it up recently to be nicer, and uh, because we started, but you have to get jumped in. You gotta, you gotta own your own motorcycle. Know how to do the basic maintenance on it. You gotta do it, for those members at least five grand, a, five thousand miles a year. Like we do ten k, and then um, you. It doesn't have to be Harley only. We were Harley only, and mm-hmm. now it's that. You know, but mm-hmm. you're. Uh, and that's because, you know, we want to support the writers, but we want to make sure that because it's our name affiliated, we want to make sure the people that are a part of us are real, you know, and not just out here jumping on a trend, right? you know, but we support each other. So we also raise money and, uh, you know, it's a membership fee that comes along with it. And then, uh, we donate part of that fee to different charities throughout the year and, um, uh, like female charities in a male dominated industry type of thing. Or mm-hmm. if we had a writer say that wanted to go to MMI school or really needed to get, um, you know, like we donate helmets or gear or whatever we can just to support the girls that support us back. Right. Oh, that's so awesome. Yeah. So we're not as badass, you know, we're, we're nice. It's pretty badass. You just don't, <laughs> you just don't bury bodies in the desert. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, anyone knows about. <laughs> that anyone, <laughs> not that anyone can't prove. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. but that's that's been fun. You know, I never rode with girls. I never really hung out with females. Uh, I was actually really intimidated by them for a long time. I mean, modeling, I had really bad experiences because it's a very shallow, two-dimensional type of world, and um, I never fit in because I just didn't like doing that stuff. I did it because it made me money, but I never felt like that was something I wanted to do, uh, and I rode motorcycles, and I was always around guys, and my dad raised me pretty much, you know, to be like a guy like before I could drive a car he bought like I got a car he took it apart and made me put it back together before I could drive it because he didn't want me on the side of the road waiting on some dude to help me he gave me a gun for my 16th birthday gave me another one when I went to college and you know he just like that that type of guy and um so hanging out with girls I didn't have anything to talk about with them I didn't like shopping not that they only shop but I don't like I don't care what I look like and and they didn't know how to put a carburetor on no, right. I'm like, what do I talk about? <laughs> I don't listen to the same types of music or watch the same type of movies. Like. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And then I started like slowly hanging out with like girls in, in motorcycling and I, and I found that it's, you know, there's a lot of girls out there that don't have that type of mentality and I judged wrong and uh, it's been cool. It's nice to have a chick to talk about chick things or I'm still a girl. You know, I still have a vagina. You know, I have bigger <laughs> balls than most men. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I'd vouch for that. Yeah, with all these things from mm-hmm. a shark diver to astronaut to Harley Davidson hooligan rider to <laughs> I never went. I'm to not, the no future, astronaut. A future president. <laughs> oh, well, a water astronaut. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. There we yeah. go. <laughs> Jet live. Oh, man. Dude, I love your stories. Thank you so much for... Um, jumping on the podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's, it's what, been fun. What, what do you think is like the biggest like like life lesson you've learned through all of these like crazy things that you do? Like, how do you keep it together? And it's keep hard. 
I mean, honestly, so it's a balance, like, right. There's a lot of different hats I wear. And the biggest one is being a mom and doing stuff that is not very typical, like of what a mother would do. And a good example is last night on my, I posted on my Instagram, actually a picture of my son and I, because you know, he's not here with me. And whenever I go out and do anything dangerous, I'm, I'm nervous. I'm nervous about it. Like we do, I do things that there's no sh- like guarantee of a safe return. I could be injured or I could not make it back. And, and I don't, I never thought about that before until I have another life to care about and care for. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so it's, you know, it's hard. I posted this thing about him not being there and someone, you know, decided to get on and be thumb Nazi and rip me a new one for it. You know, basically oh, saying, keyboard warriors. yeah, yeah. Telling me I was a bad mom and I get that every now and then, but at the same time, I What's just, your response to that. Well, that one I just ignored. Cause I just like went back to their page and realized oh. they're just, that's what they love to do is troll. But most of the time, In general, yeah. yeah, what I would, my response is. You know, I just live a life of passion and I I don't believe that just because you have a child, your life stops. You know, I think that when you do stop your life and only devote it to a kid, you're teaching them very little about the world and about them following their own dreams and passions, you know, and you just have to find a way to make it work and balance. And I just, um, I teach my son to like find his own legacy, you know, and, and to live that. And, um, hopefully, you know, I'm just doing a how hopefully i'm doing a good job at it and you never know that's the thing like parenting it's not you've never you know i've never been a parent before so you're figuring it out as you go along i mean but there's a lot of like books on parenting but there's like not a book on parenting like yeah right it could be anything it's all different different for everybody yeah 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 so lead by example follow your dreams right and my son like loves it. I mean, he there's I've given him so, so many opportunities. I mean, he's been all over the world. My mom has only flown twice in her life. You know, there are a lot of adults out there. By the time my son was like 10, he had done more than most adults and seen more and it's just well diverse and maybe misunderstood by his classmates cuz they haven't done it, but one day he's going to be the coolest kid in school cuz he's done all these things and and I feel like fortunate that I'm giving my son that life, you know. And, uh, so I think that's the hardest thing to balance and then keeping it together because I I have a rad life, you know, it's, it's not easy, but it's fucking fun. You know, I get to ride motorcycles for a living. You get to ride motorcycles for a living. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's so cool. Um, Letitia Klein, you can follow Letitia's adventures on social media. Yeah. Uh, Letitia Klein. Yeah. It's L E T I C I A C L I N E. Not the Jewish version, K-L-E-I-N. Said, <laughs> said with a southern accent. Yeah. I'm and a southern girl with a Letitia name, which is really weird. With a Letitia name. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thanks so much. It was awesome having you. I love your stories and we'll definitely want to do something again, have you back on the show. For sure. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for listening and make sure to catch other episodes where we get into it with pro skaters Chris Cole, David Gonzalez, Jaws, and Tony Hawk. And motorcycle mayhemers Roland Sands, Jeremy Twitch Stenberg, and Carrie Hart. I'm your host, Eric Hendricks, and you're listening to Boozed and Bruised on Revolver.